G'day viewers. In this segment I'll tell you about the TCP fast retransmit and fast recovery behaviors. So this is the second part where we're going to look at how TCP implements the AIMD control law. We've already seen the AI part of which slow start um, is one contributing factor. Now by looking at fast retransmit and fast recovery we're covering the multiplicative decrease or MD part. Um, and I would also say hang in there. We're almost there in terms of TCP congestion control. And congestion control is, I would say, the most complicated behavior of TCP to understand. Okay, so just a little bit of context again, just to uh, refresh your memory. We're trying to get to this additive increase multiplicative decrease controller. It has good properties. We're doing it by having the sender control a congestion window, increasing or decreasing it. That's indirectly controlling the rate. We've seen in, in the previous segment that the sender can use slow start to rapidly increase the congestion window to about the right time while still using an act clock to keep the traffic reasonably smooth. And it can then use additive increase around about the right congestion window. This is all good. The only problem was we then detected loss when it finally occurred with a timeout. And by that time, the act clock has run down because timeouts are relatively large compared to the time it takes to act a packet. So the sender needed to slow start all the way again. We haven't got to the multiplicative decrease part yet. And going all the way back to uh, essentially starting from a, a congestion window one seems a little extreme. We can do better. The way we're going to do better is by using more information in the act stream. In fact, by looking at the act stream, Oh, you can usually infer something about loss. Let me show you how. TCP uses this cumulative ACK, if you recall. The cumulative ACK gives the highest in-order sequence number that's been received. When there's no loss, it will just steadily advance from one sequence number to the next. As the data segments are sent, the ACK will come in and it will just rise, counting up. When there's loss, the, there will be a hole in the sequence numbers at the receiver side and the cumulative act will get stuck at some value. The acts will then repeat the highest in order sequence number that's been received. These acts are called duplicate acts because they're sending the same number over and over again. And if you think about it, these acts actually give us hints about what has arrived, or rather what data hasn't arrived. So they tell us every time we get an act, we know that some new data arrived, but we know that it wasn't the next segment because if it was, the cumulative act number would have risen. So there's a good chance that in fact it is the next segment just beyond the one that's been acknowledged that has been lost. The fast retransmit heuristic uses this sort of uh, inference to work out that a packet has been lost, which packet, and to retransmit it. So in particular, when the TCP uh, sender receives three duplicate acts, it treats this as a loss event. It says, aha, loss has happened in the network and it will immediately retransmit the next expected segment beyond the ACK value in the cumulative ACK because it thinks that's the one that's been lost. Three sounds a little arbitrary, why like three duplicate ACKs, not two or four or something. Well, some small number like this, and three is just a small number, allows a little bit of tolerance for packet reordering that could occasionally happen in the internet. This will cause duplicate acts also. Um, yet it still detects any loss which actually occurs quickly. We can see the heuristic working here. You can see the act stream coming in. One, two, three, four, five. Now we get duplicates. Here's a duplicate. First duplicate, five. Well, so a packet arrived on the other side, but it wasn't six. Well, this act would have gone up again. Five, still haven't got six. Five, still haven't got six. That was, this was the third duplicate act. I'm going to circle this because right here we would resend six. Right? We'll assume that that has been lost. And you'll note that after that we're still receiving duplicate acts because even though we've sent six, it's going to take a little while for six to reach the other side and the cumulative act to advance and us to hear back a bigger cumulative act. We can see some of those effects on the time sequence diagram here. We have again the sender on the left and the receiver on the right. Now acts have been sent merrily, also 
um, let me see. So these, this text is actually showing the receipt of information. Okay, so the sender and receiver labels are important. So in fact, this coming in is Act 10. And you can see the acts are going up normally as they come. And the last, they go up 10, 11, 12, 13. And for the last Act 13 that's received, that's Act 13 there. I'm just going to do this to make this figure a little clearer then we actually send data 20 here to the receiver. Before that we would have sent data 19, 18 and so forth. But now look what happens here. First duplicate ACK, ACK 13. Uh oh. So we can't advance the window so no new data goes out. ACK 13 again, same thing. ACK 13 now. This is the third duplicate ACK. So fast retransmit hits and we send 14. And now after that we're going to get more Act 13s until eventually the Act comes back. And that's not going to be an Act for 14, that's going to be an Act for where we were already. Previously we had sent all data um, up through 20, uh, but 14 was lost. Now that we've got 14, our cumulative Act can jump to 20. And we see here the Act jump to 20. So the hole's been filled, everything's good again, and now we can continue sending packets. Okay. However, oh, oh hang on, let me just finish our fast retransmit. So fast retransmit can repair a single segment loss, and it can detect that this uh, segment has been lost very quickly. This is usually before the timeout goes off, because it really it's, it's about the shortest amount of time it could possibly take before you could even hear information from the other side about the loss. However, you might have noticed that we're not finished yet. After the uh, fast retransmit segment, we had some quiet period where we were just sort of waiting, twiddling our thumbs for the act to advance, even though we were to jump, even though we were getting new acts in that were further duplicate acts, and we weren't sending out packets. And we didn't actually get to multiplicatively decreasing the congestion window yet, so we're not finished. We can do more with these acts. In fact, we can infer not only what packet is likely to be lost, but something about what packets are likely to have already been received on the other side. So, and we can do this by looking at further duplicate acts. What's going on is that every time we get another duplicate act, we know that something has arrived. We know not only that it was not you know, one beyond whatever's there, or the act number would have changed, but most likely it will be it's got to be something we sent, so it's likely to be the segment numbers beyond the loss. And if loss is relatively rare, it's likely to be the segments in sequence just going on and on and on. So what we can do is we can advance the congestion sliding window. If the purpose of that window was to control how many segments were in the network to make sure the queues didn't overflow, so we know from the act that a packet has left the network, so it's okay to advance that window and send a new packet into the network. Um, we, we, we won't increase the load in the queues. The new packet that we would send into the network are just new data packets as we expect further out into the future. So we can turn some of these insights into the fast recovery heuristic. Fast recovery works with fast retransmit. First you do the fast retransmit. Then, and we haven't got to this before, but now we do, now you multiplicatively decrease your congestion window. You do this because we're not going to slow start. We're going to just do the multiplicative decrease and then get back to the nice additive increase. Now, in fast recovery, as further duplicate acts come in, just imagine that, that they're really uh, the, the acts for... Uh, whatever you expected in the normal sequence going forward. So if you like, you're keeping a shadow congestion window, which we're just going to begin to move along um, and uh, inflate so that we can send new packets into the network because we know packets are leaving the network. So when we do this, when we pretend these duplicate acts are really something higher that we expected, then we will allow new segments to be sent into the network in response to the acts. Eventually, after a good round trip time has gone by, our act number will jump as we fill in the hole. At that point, we can reconcile these two different views of this inflated window or shadow acts where we're pretending there's something else, and the acknowledgements we've sent, uh, we've received in the packets we've actually sent. Okay, so you can see on this diagram, here we would do something like this. We've got the acts coming in, 
five, five, duplicate, duplicate, duplicate here. So we'll do the resend. Six here. Now we're getting further duplicates. After a little while, we've, we've halved our congestion window. We've multiplicatively decreased it. So it's smaller, so we might need to let some of the packets drain out of the network. But at some point, let's say here, while our ACK has not jumped, we would like to send new data as ACKs come. So I'll say send, uh, I don't know, 10. We'll just, I'll just pretend we're up to 10 now. So that's what fast recovery is going to let us do. Here's a time sequence diagram to go over it a little bit. We have the sender on the left and the receiver on the right as before. So now I'm just showing the bit for where Act 12 came in here. And we'll go through the sequence. You get to Act 13, we get a duplicate, duplicate, third duplicate. At this point, we'll do several things. We'll do the fast retransmit. That's the data 14. That's to fill in the hole on the other side. And we'll now set uh, our SS thresh and to uh, the congestion window over 2 and we'll also change the congestion window to the congestion window over 2. So we'll multiplicatively decrease the congestion window. Now because it's smaller some other packets may need to, need to leave the network but with fast recovery eventually as we get another duplicate ACK in we will send packets out here. here. So more ACKs advance the window and you can send new segments before the ACK jumps. Sometime later down here the ACK jumps and at that stage we can exit fast recovery. We know what's over the other side. We know what's sent. We can make sure that our congestion window is okay. And you can see just here on the other side, just by using fast recovery we managed to get um, an extra bit of data uh, into the network before uh, b before our hole was filled at 14 and it was all lacked and everything. So fast recovery will help us send more data through the network as well as to keep that ACK clock going. Okay, so in conjunction with fast retransmit, fast recovery allows us to re repair a single segment loss quickly. We can work out that something's been lost, we can retransmit it, while that is going and we're waiting for the ACK back, we can continue to send packets and keep everything going. When you put all of these pieces together, they allow us to realize additive increase, multiplicative decrease. So we're now adjusting the congestion window up and down according to this formula. We're not using timeouts if we're just dealing with single packet losses. That's great. And we're not using slow start after loss because we keep the ACK clock going and we just multiplicatively decrease the congestion window. These mechanisms are implemented in TCP Reno, which is the historic version of TCP that came out in 1990 that combined, that put all of these pieces together, slow start, fast retransmit, fast recovering, as well as some of the uh, better uh, timeout estimators that we'd seen before. And the, the multiplicative decrease factor that we use here is a pretty hefty one of a half. So we halve the congestion window on a loss event. This will sort of allow, even if there are two flows, a new flow has come in, it will sort of allow two flows to quickly each get half of the bandwidth. So it will accommodate fairly large changes at one go. When you put all of those mechanisms together, here's how the congestion window goes over time. It goes up with a slow start. We cross the slow start threshold and we're in a nice additive increase. That's what we wanted. Now when there's loss, we're going to go down and do a multiplicative decrease. We would find loss quickly and we would maybe go down immediately. We halved our congestion window so we had to wait for a few acts to exit the network. Then we're back to our additive increase. Eventually you'll get too high, halve again, and so forth. And this is the TCP sawtooth that we're following. We've kept the act clock running all the way through these loss events uh, without doing any version of slow start. And this is the behavior that classic TCP produces. You can see here it's actually driving the network into congestion, filling up the queues, and then recovering gracefully. So it sort of has to probe the boundary of congestion uh, to find out just how much bandwidth there was in the network. Now we're going to stop there for understanding congestion control. We've seen how classic TCP congestion control has been implemented. Modern congestion control goes beyond it 
in, uh, in many small respects. I'm just going to briefly mention some of them. So we've got to Reno. TCP Reno can repair one loss per round trip time using its mechanisms. If you were unfortunate enough to have multiple losses per round trip time, you would end up needing a timeout to recover from them. Then we'd have to start again with slow start because we've timed out and our act clock is broken and so forth. A common version of TCP that's deployed in the internet today, perhaps the most popular, is a classic style mechanism, is TCP New Reno. That's Reno with further heuristics that allow it to repair multiple losses in one round trip time without a timeout. So it's still using inference, but it's doing a slightly better job, and it can often do a little better in terms of repairing things. But one step beyond that, that's an even better idea, is something called SAC, TCP with Selective Acknowledgements. We actually looked at the Selective Acknowledgement option earlier, as well as the Cumulative Act. They add information about the byte ranges you've got. Once you've got these ACT ranges, there are ranges of bytes that have been received that are carried in the acknowledgements from the receiver. The sender no longer needs to guess which packets may or may not have got there. The receiver is telling it. So this is uh, much uh, cleaner and more straightforward in terms of trying to work out what might be lost and retransmitting it. You can, uh, you can retransmit without the guesswork. So SAC is the option that is increasingly used in modern TCP. It's simply a matter of deploying it and turning it on. So now we know how TCP congestion control works in routers that uh, lose packets.